Today on the podcast, we are speaking with Tracy McMillan. Tracy is a writer. Um, she fooled me into thinking she was a certified <laughs> marriage and family therapist because she is so well versed, so convincing, and and really is. I, I loved her uh, comment. You're going to hear she's pro adjacent in the uh, in the marriage and family therapist role, but a really really inspiring conversation about vulnerability and how other people see you and what your responsibility in in that is. It's like this this episode with Tracy was really inspiring. Um, she really talks about how she approaches writing, um, how she her views of the world and how that's informed a lot of her different projects, including you know this most her most recent project, um, which is a little bit of self, biographical, um, called Unprisoned, um, you know, and, and how she really views the world and how she brings that through in her writing. We hope you are inspired by, um, by this conversation and really enjoy it. So thank you for being here. And we want to hear your story of how you got to, uh, got to where you are today. Well, that's a long story. How much time do we have? <laughs> hours, 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 hours. So thank you for having me, first of all. Well, I would say in part, the reason my story is so long is that I didn't start writing scripted television until I was 42. Oh that was the beginning of this stage of my career. So there was a lot that happened up till, you know, up till then. And then there's been a lot that's happened since. Um, but I would start by saying I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, I left when I was 19. I went to the University of Utah randomly. <laughs> I had a whole thing where I, I moved to places sight unseen. Um, <laughs> I moved to Salt Lake City sight unseen. I moved to Portland, Oregon sight unseen. I moved to Los Angeles having been there one time. Um, I moved to Columbus, Ohio essentially sight unseen. So what does that mean? It means I'm willing to take a, a risk to do something that um, certainly I've never done before. But so I think there's a certain amount of risk taking that you have to embrace um, if you want to have a life that you don't currently have, right? I mean, if you'd make like incremental moves, you're going to get incremental progress. If you make big moves that you are, are still grounded in reality, um, I think you can have a uh, you can have things happen that are really outside the current box or the current reality. Um, so I, again, went to the University of Utah randomly. Um, I got a broadcast journalism degree because, you know, I'm coming from a background where I was in foster care. My dad was in prison my whole life. I had essentially no parents once I left Minneapolis and no support system. So I needed to get a job where, or a degree where there was a job at the end. Um, broadcast journalism was that degree in the years. I graduated in 1989. Um, it took me, well, about seven years to graduate from college. Uh, I took two years off. I worked my way through. It was a very long process. I wasn't sure if it was ever gonna happen. That was the first kind of most amazing thing. I, I couldn't believe it, you know, I was like, whoa. Um, I'm the first person in my world, you know, in my family, such as it is, if you can call the wolves I was raised by <laughs> a family. At the time, did you, did you know to feel proud of yourself? Um, I felt more, I don't feel proud necessarily. I felt relieved. Okay. I was like, okay, I might be able to make it to the middle class if I can manage to get a job. And getting a job was a very uh, long, arduous process. I moved to Portland, Oregon. I started working at a radio station. I had this terrible job for $5.50 an hour where I made phone calls and played little snippets of songs. Um, and then people would tell me which song they liked. And then we would feed all that data into a computer. And I was like, I can't believe I went to college for this. <laughs> <laughs> but the um, radio station was in a, it was it's kind of old school. These kinds of stations don't really exist anymore. It yeah. was a AM and FM and a television station, all privately mm -hmm. held by a woman who also had the same configuration in Seattle. Um, and I, there was a job posted one day on the job board where there was an associate producer opening in news 
And I basically went and begged for the job. Um, and the news director said, you know what? I'm going to hire you. And I was like, oh, my God, thank you. <laughs> um, so that was the beginning of my TV news career. That was 1990. Um, I wrote TV news for 16 years. I moved to New York. I did it there. I moved to L.A. I did it there. It became sort of like it was very much a part time job for me. I worked on a per diem basis. I never was like climbing a ladder in TV news. But TV news was an excellent background as a writer because you're just getting it done because it needs to get done. It's like there's a deadline and no one cares yeah. if you're inspired. <laughs> you just have to get the writing done and do it. So um, and it it teaches you beginning, middle, end. Um, it's very structured in this one way. And I went on to produce newscasts. I produced longer form stories. I did all sorts of things in the basic realm of television news. And then in 2006, I'd always sort of dreamt of writing scripted television, but I had no idea how to go about it. And I met one person, uh, a mom friend. It was a blind mom date. And the other mom was a television writer. And I was like, I've always wanted to do that. And she was like, well, um, usually what people do is they write a spec script and a half hour comedy is basically your your protagonist has a problem and they try to solve it and they get up a tree and they try to solve it again and they get up a tree again and they try to solve it again and they fall out of the tree. And that's basically the structure. So I went, <laughs> OK. And I walked. <laughs> I went home and I wrote two spec scripts, a Dharma and Greg and a Drew Carey show. And I showed them to her and she was like, wait, what? You did two of these? Like, and I was like, well, yeah. Um, and she was like, wow, everyone thinks they can do this and you actually could. And I wish I could tell you that that's the day that my scripted television career started, but it didn't. Four more years passed. I wrote a feature and by this time she had blown up. Um, I showed it to her. She's like, I'm way too busy to read it. I'll tell you what, I know you can write. I'll give it to my agent. And if he likes it, he'll call you. And if he doesn't, he won't. And he called me eight months later. Oh and gosh. there was a number of beats, as you can imagine, in that story. But I went in and I met with him. And that was in February of 2006. And I got my first job in June of 2007. And I've basically been here ever since. And there are a thousand more beats to how I got to getting a show on the air and hosting a show on the Oprah Winfrey Network and writing three books and all the things that have happened since then. But it comes down to this. I write my ass off. <laughs> and whenever anybody tells me to do something like, hey, you should write an essay and do it as a staged reading, I do it. Uh -huh. And I just, I give myself assignments and I execute the assignments. You know, I'll say, oh, especially early on, it's like, write a sexy thriller, write a half hour comedy, write a broadcast comedy, write a scripted, you know, like a streaming comedy, write an hour long light, um, a light hour, like every, I just did all the stuff. And, um, you know, the only way to really be a writer is to write. Yeah. And yeah. so I just did lots and lots and lots of writing. So that's, my basic story. Um, were you always writing creatively um, on the side, even when you were when you were in your in the news world? Yeah, I think so. Like I remember somebody coming to me and saying, "Hey, we have this idea for a children's book. Would you want to try a sample chapter?" Uh -huh. And and I remember being very into that assignment. I probably spent like a week down the writing hole, you know, where you're just in the zone. Um, and when I showed it to them, they were like, this is really good. And I and I remember somebody else came to me and said, um, I'm writing an independent, an independent film and it's going to be about three women in the East Village and I want three different women in the East Village to write it. And that actually ended up getting made. And um, so I, I had this, yeah, I was always doing other things. And I had the sense that, I don't know if, if you throw me the ball, I really yeah. enjoy doing something I haven't done before. Uh -huh. So if somebody said to me, write a book of poetry, I'd be like, oh, that sounds like a fun assignment. Um, the writing is my favorite part, the writing yeah. and the collaborating. I love producing as well. But what I really, really love is 
just, it's like a dream state, you know, or it's just that process of taking things from nothing, from the no thing and turning them into a thing. And um, that's kind of what I live for. <laughs> did, did you always... <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. In chicken marinade. <laughs> <laughs> did you always, um, did you write as a child, you know, even like as an outlet for yourself or did you always know that writing was ingrained in yeah. you? I always journaled. I remember, um, I'm still friends with most of my friends from high school. And I remember one of my friends saying to me in like 10th grade, we had had a writing assignment and, you know, where you, you hand the paper to the person behind you and then they correct your paper. And I remember her saying to me, and she remembers this too. She's like, you should be a writer after <laughs> reading my thing. She's like, you should be a writer. And I was like, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> but, and, you know, I grew up watching Mary Tyler Moore. Like, yeah, I don't know. I was always a storyteller. You know, I think I always was. But did I know what that was? Not exactly. And did I know how to go about it? No. But I think that's sort of the the takeaway from my story is you don't yeah. really need to know how you just need to know what, mm -hmm. and you just keep doing it, do the part you can do. And eventually you just, I don't know. I think it's energetic. You just attract the match for where you are, yeah. you know? Um, and that is going to be more opportunities. Um, people it's hard. I mean, here's the thing it's hard to find uh, somebody who can really execute an assignment. That is not yeah. that many people yeah. who, you know, you can throw the ball and they're going to make a basket. And um, I remember hearing somebody talk about an entertainment career or a writing career is basically, and be wildly talented, always turn your work in on time and be great to work with any two out of three. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm always going to turn my work in on time and I'll be great to work with. I'll just be a sane person. And those two things alone will be enough probably to like, you know, get you a career, some kind of career. And then if you're talented too, like so much the better, but that's for someone else to decide. Wow. That's amazing. Is, um, how is Yvette Bowser your is she your right the writing friend that you uh that you're talking oh, about no no I only met Yvette like a year ago oh okay um, with the project I didn't you know this is like 22 years ago oh now. okay okay that I was, uh, well my kid was two and he'll be 26 on uh, tomorrow so oh wow, that was wow. 24 years ago Okay. It's been a long road <laughs> the um uh, so with with unprisoned I mean, you've always been, you've always been so honest about your, I follow, I followed you on, I followed you on Instagram for a very long time um, before, uh, but with, with Unprisoned, um, I know you've always been very open, very honest about your person, you know, your life and everything. Yeah. How, how did you come about deciding that your story was going to be this, this big, you know, this big project that you put out there. And, mm -hmm. um, well, I'll pause. I want you to answer that. And then I, you know, how it attracted just all of this talent that, that it attracted. Yeah. Um, well, I remember early on, someone said to me, you have to write what only you can write. Mm -hmm. That is, and, and I came up in the time right when we were getting like you know, the explosion of peak TV, which, you know, in many respects, peak TV is concurrent with people telling personal stories. Um, things that, whether it's flea bag or, you know, stories that weren't necessarily broadcast comedies, but that were, or broadcast even hour longs, but things that were like specific and almost literary for, you know, whether it was Mad Men or I just think about all the like really inspiring shows of the last, you know, 10, 15 years and the time I've been in the business. So many of them are like very personal voices, even yeah. if the things happening on screen aren't autobiographical, the voice is so specific to one person. And, um, and I feel like, you know, people that I watched come up that I was close to 
um, really were doing things that were very much based on their own lives. And I always tell writers, find the thing that you're most ashamed of, the thing that you think you have to hide from everybody and write about that. Because that's what the world needs. The world needs catharsis. And catharsis comes from the writer going to those places within, being willing to look at them honestly, um, without shame, without, um, you know, with a lot of like love, insight, um, honesty, forgiveness, all the higher virtues. And you go to that place, you encode that or formalize that in a logic, a structure, a beginning, middle, end. And it allows the, the reader, the listener, the audience to go on that journey for themselves without having had to do all that crazy work, (laughs) you know, and then they go on the journey and it's like, they are processing. And that's what I feel is, you know, what a writer is out here doing. Yeah. You know, I always say, I'm not doing it for like the handbags. You know what I'm saying? Like (laughs) I'm doing it. My purpose is about helping people live better lives. And I do that, whichever, with whatever way I can, you know? Um, And then I sort of let the, I let the universe tell me what to do, you know, okay, you're going to do this. You know, I wasn't going to do social media. I didn't want to do video and social media. I didn't want to be on TV. I spent 16 years being behind the scenes in TV news. But when, you know, I remember a young woman saying to me, she was like 24, she was social media manager. She said, Because I was like, I don't really want to be on TV and I don't really want to do video. And she was like, you know, with all due respect, it's not about you. It's about helping people. And I was like, she's right. (laughs) (laughs) She's right. You have to be a little bit fearless and be willing to do things that maybe you would rather not do. Like, you know tell everybody about all your <laughs> all your family stuff but in fact you set yourself free in doing so and you set others free as well so it's now i get it i'm like okay fine you know what else should we talk about <laughs> you know um so yeah that's how i decided to write a story about my dad getting out of prison mostly cuz it's something i was trying to work out for myself mm-hmm. And there's millions of other people who are also in my boat who have never seen a television show about the family after incarceration, you know? Yeah. And I was like, well, I guess I I have to be the one to write it, I guess, because I don't know, I'm here and I can. So that's how we got here. And then how did these amazing talents come on board? I don't know. I feel like so lucky but I think that Carrie Washington and Delroy Lindo and I, what we all have in common is that we really wanted, we wanted to do something that had a bigger meaning and was going to like, I don't know, create some good in the world as well as be like a wonderful writing, acting uh, challenge and project. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a great story. Um, of a father and a daughter. It's really universal. Um, The prison part is kind of like their circumstances, my circumstances, you know. Did, when you first wrote, started writing, and then it went out, like you said, these amazing people that are, uh, that wanted to be involved and, and got involved and executed it, was it so it's so funny and it's so sweet and it's so charming and it's so heart. I, I honestly, I mean, we, we were talking about it yesterday. I, I haven't ever seen Carrie in a role like that, that endears her to the, um, the viewer so much. So was cool. what part of that went into it and what part did they like bring out in a different way? Because it is, I mean, you're, it's, I think it's one of her, her best performances. Mm, that's cool. Um, thank you for saying that. I think, well, I know I started out, I mean, let's go back a step. Like when people meet my dad, 
now he's passed just recently. Um, but when people would meet my dad, they would always be like, well, what a charming man. He's so great and nice. And you would never imagine that he was in prison for like 40 years. And I'm like, I know. And I think that was one of the things I wanted to communicate is that even though you have like these tough or like grim circumstances, who you are is who you are. My dad's like a light, fun open kind of great spirit a spirit to be around and I'm a person who we laugh together and I find basically everything funny um because human beings are you know we are very dear um and so I wanted to show a family like ours because I know that most people wouldn't imagine that that's how we how we would be Mm -hmm. um So that was first and foremost. And that's, I think, where the tone really originates is Mm -hmm. in the tone between my dad and me. Um, But I also think that, um, you know, people say, where did you get the tone? And I'm like, the tone is just life. You know, life is funny, heartbreaking, you know, frustrating, you know, fear, sometimes there's fear Mm -hmm. and anger and all the things, you know, and um, I was super clear that I wanted to show heroes, not anti-heroes. I identify with being heroic in my own life. I identify with wanting to be the best person that I can be and trying really, really hard to do better than my circumstances. And that earnestness and that I feel like um, gives, I don't know, gives me hope and I relate to it and I want to see other people trying to do that. Um, the one thing about maybe the recent period of television that and storytelling that we're coming out of is like, I don't really relate. I feel like a lot of female protagonists in particular, also male protagonists are um, what I would say they would have a, an avoidant um, attachment strategy. (laughs) That would be the term. (laughs) And, um, I don't relate to an avoidant. So the avoidant is a dismissive. They're dismissive. They're like, I don't care. Um, the whole strategy is like, whatever. Um, can we swear on this podcast? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Well, like for example, when it comes to relationships, you would see a lot of female characters who are gonna let's say fuck the pizza guy and i'm like see if i fuck the pizza guy i would fall in love with the pizza guy (laughs) i am an anxiously attached person who does not um and a a secure person wouldn't do it in the first place do you know what i'm saying it's like so i wanted to see some characters that i related to Mm -hmm. first and foremost so i think there's been a lot of like badasses on TV and I'm not saying anything about badasses uh, except for that I think there's a way to be vulnerable and heroic in that you are you can be hurt you're letting people affect you you're affected by life you know and I just think and it just so happens that coming out of the pandemic I think a lot of us were in touch with our vulnerability in ways that maybe we weren't really in touch with it before that so um that's a lot of where I think the sweetness, the tone of the show, mm-hmm. the relationship between the father and daughter um, are really coming from in the show is, you know, it's about being vulnerable. Absolutely. In terms of, you know, as, as you look at, you know, the show and your different roles with the show, Did you find yourself, you know, from a more from your own, like from a tactical perspective, you know, you've been on unscripted before on unscripted before, you know, even from like Mad Men and, and, you know, even you were on also doing the runaways, but you know, what was that transition like? Because this was your story and how you envisioned it versus coming up with almost, you know, you were in fictional worlds and now you're bringing a fiction, nonfiction twist to, to what this is. Like, what was that vulnerability and what was your vision like? And how did that morph over the course of the taping? Well, yeah, it's interesting. I feel like 
um, maybe because I, I got a show on the air in my 16th year of writing scripted television, which is actually pretty late, you know, mm-hmm. um, especially in peak TV. A lot of people, you know, they've done a short film or they did a, a they wrote a cool story or they wrote a book or whatever. And then boom, they're, they're a show creator. So I think because I came to this with a lot of years writing for, first of all, um, TV news anchors and putting myself in their voice. And second of all, for all these different characters that that I've written on whatever, however many shows I've been on, like, I don't remember how many, but it's maybe like seven or eight or something. And then I've, I usually developed every year. So I've developed probably 10 different shows that didn't go, Mm -hmm. um, over the years, but, um, I think I'm used to writing for somebody who isn't me. Like I'm not so, um, and also I've been to tons and tons and tons and tons of therapy. So you really do develop in a a self-awareness and an ability to see yourself, not from inside your own world at all times, but you learn how to step outside your world and go, Oh, who's that person? Oh, because that amount of detachment is very helpful if you want to, um, you know, do new behaviors. And obviously coming from where I came from, I had a lot of work to do internally to be able to have the life that I have now. Um, And probably there's nothing more critical to my, you know, skills as a writer than the work that I've had to do to um, learn that I have choices, to see myself in ways that, you know, to like evolve myself. That is really about seeing yourself as a character in a way and going, well, do I want to be doing that? (laughs) No, I do not. Okay, let's do something else, you know? Um, So coming to this work, I'm not super married to my own version of me. Um, or my version of my dad or anybody else. And very clearly, Carrie and Delroy are not playing me and my dad. Um, Yes, they might be taking some things here and there, but they created characters because they're gifted actors and that's what they do, Mm -hmm. you know? I would have never said, well, it didn't, it wasn't that way in real life or, because we don't need to do real life. We just need to start with real life and let the feelings be real. And there are many, many situations in the, in the, season one that really happened for example we really went to Alabama Mm -hmm. Um, there are many many things that really happened but but not everything really happened not even close for starters my dad never came to live with me (laughs) (laughs) I would never let that happen (laughs) because that wouldn't be good for me and my kid you know yeah Um, so yeah I think you have to be able to as a writer give your characters real thoughts and feelings, but not insist that they act exactly like you acted or that their lives conform to your life. Yeah, That's when you really, that's the magic uh, sauce for me is enough detachment, but also enough real. Was it, um, did you ever find yourself, find in the production that it was difficult to kind of let let things go and let them, create their own get their own, have their own version of these roles come out or was that welcome oh, really no I don't think so I don't know why I'm not so one of the things so when I wrote my memoir in 2000 I probably sold it in 2008 uh-huh. I wrote it in 2009 it came out in 2010 and the process of writing that memoir was probably the beginning of learning how to just let it be there whatever it is mm-hmm. and um what I basically decided at that time, because like, what are we afraid of in telling the truth? We're afraid of being judged, you know? And, you know, I've done a lot of like Buddhist type stuff, mindfulness, meditation. And what I realized is like, well, from the Buddhist perspective, I am not who I think I am. So how could I be who they, the reader, the audience, the general public, how could I be who they think I am? (laughs) I'm not even who I think I am. So it doesn't really matter. We can put it out there with, um, you know, bravely because no one can really judge. Even if what they're judging, they're not judging you. They're judging an idea they have in their mind. It's not real. And knowing that, 
means that whatever, like, I just hold on to the idea of that kind of self very lightly because mm-hmm. I know, well, is that real? I don't think so. <laughs> I wish I we could all be that healthy. I was like, I feel very unhealthy right <laughs> now. Right, right? Really? <laughs> no, well, it's a practice. You right, know? Yeah. It's a practice. And I feel like I probably didn't get a show until I was ready to be like very loose about that. I also feel like when I wrote my memoir, I, I envisioned it as a covenant between the covers of the book. Mm-hmm. It's like, Everything that exists in that book, it's like Vegas. You know what I'm saying? It stays in the covers <laughs> of that book. And like, if somebody wants to come out here and judge me for it, I don't know. I just, I, I don't, I don't think it's, I guess I don't think it's real. Yeah. I yeah. just think like, oh yeah, I could see how you could think that, but everybody makes mistakes and there's nothing, there's really no, it's all okay. Like it yeah. really is okay. Yeah. And that's what I hope to bring to these characters is like, I want to write about the dad being in prison. It's okay. He's still a worthy human. Right. You know, how do we, how do we show that? Well, we write from that place, you know? I love the scenes where Carrie is, uh, is vulnerable and kind of spits it all out there. And then she's like surprised and her people are all like, yeah, okay, that's fine. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and and kind of, you know, we're like, we're, we, we like hearing your true story. We're still going to be your friends. Those are really those are really the baby reveal scene where, you know, those, yeah. those are really, I think, very cool scenes to see how that people react to her and putting yeah. it all out there. Yeah. That's a real thing. Very much a real thing um, that I wanted to get in there. Yeah. Like there are certain things when you have a, a background like this, I mean, of the course, the interesting thing is I didn't tell anybody very much about my life for a long time. I thought if I tell everybody my dad's in prison and it's been in prison my whole life and that, you know, my biological mom was a prostitute, like, Oh my God, they're just going to look at me. They're never going to let me in the club of, you know, people with homes and, (laughs) you know, but then what I learned, and this has been the beauty of my writing career and my Hollywood career specifically is that, the more I leaned into the facts and the reality of my story, the the better that my career went. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> because people, I don't know, it was the opposite of what I thought was going to happen. And I think when you start telling the truth, you set people, that's why it's called unprisoned, because it's about setting yourself free. Mm-hmm. The whole thing is about freedom. Like, hopefully we can just come here into this life and, you know, set everyone around us free, feel like we're enough, you know? This is like the bigger stuff that I'm here for is yeah. how do we just love ourselves and love each other? That's really what it's about, you know, um, and connect. That is what life is about. It's really not about like um, a great career or, I mean, it's fun to have a great career, but Honestly, all this could go away and I would be perfectly happy if I could be of service in these in these same ways to people, mm-hmm. you know, because that's really where the meaning comes from. Well, you've been in a, a whirlwind of this project and everything that that's going with it. What uh, what's what's next? What are you working on now or are you uh, are you looking forward to working on? Well, I'm really work, looking forward to working on a season two of this show. Yeah. Hopefully that will happen. Um, I feel good about it. Yeah. I have lots of story left to tell. Um, I'm writing a feature for Sony uh, about a female rapper that I'm really enjoying. There's lots of swear words in that <laughs> one. <laughs> but I'm I'm interested in like, what I'm interested in about that is seeing I'm interested in seeing characters that I haven't seen before mm-hmm. and what their internal lives are you know what is the internal life of a young woman from the Bronx who has a dream mm-hmm. I there's a lot for me to relate to there sure I'm from Minneapolis but I get what it's like to go how am I going to get an economic foothold in America how am I going to do that and having that be like a, a like an impossible dream basically um so i'm working on that um 
I have a couple other things that I'm interested in doing. I want to write another book. Mm. I, sometimes I want to like do a game show. I want to like host a new version. <laughs> of the game. That would be you know, fun. I don't, I don't really know exactly what's going to happen. I hope some stuff happens that I can't even imagine right now. You right. Know? Some surprises come your way. What, yeah. um, what we love to, to, we love to know what our guests are, are watching, reading, enjoying, um, what, what do you, what do you like to, uh, consume as far as content? Um, well, I'm a big, big learner, so I want to watch anything that is going to make me learn something. Um, I'm a very big journalism fan. I love all sorts of magazine and, um, you know, I read the New York times every day. I love the New Yorker, the Atlantic. Like I'm, I want to learn. I want to sink. My, I love the internet to be honest. <laughs> Um, and not like the internet, like the scrolling internet, although I certainly do my share yeah. of scrolling, but I'm more interested in like stories of people and places and, uh, moments, you know? Um, so journalism is probably the number one thing that I, that I watch as a, or uh, that I consume. Um, we just got COVID last week after three years. <sighs> <laughs> and so we caught up on succession. I uh, love succession. I love the crown. I love things that are going to take me into a time and place and things that are really rooted in the present world. Um, I like things that are funny. Uh, I love Ted Lasso. Um, you know, but I would say I don't watch as much as I read. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a big, big, um, I'm always learning and adding to my sort of self-taught marriage and family therapy <laughs> practice. So I'm always in the latest of all that stuff, you know, whether that's attachment research, okay. um, you know, there's so much over there to learn. There's so much in relationship science that is happening right now. Um, it's really exciting. And then I'm interested in translating that into things that, are stories that are kind of meaningful and current, mm -hmm. you know? And um, yeah, so I spend a lot of time reading stuff like that. So that's part of your bigger process. Definitely. Yeah. Big part of it. Yeah. Like I, I can't wait to read some big, um, textbook on attachment disturbances in adults. <laughs> like, that's light reading for me. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but I love it because there's you guys, it's so exciting. Like we yeah. think in the area of relationships that we're just kind of making it up as we go along. No, we are a species and we evolve to do certain things. And within our evolution, we have some choices, but it's not nearly the number of choices that we think. <laughs> I thought that pro I thought that you were prof I thought you were professional a marriage and family therapist. I thought that you were like a, a light. I didn't know it was self uh, self taught. Yeah. I thought you were a licensed. A that was one of your careers. I'm a jailhouse marriage and family therapist. <laughs> so it's like I've done so much work on my own case. Now uh -huh. I can help yours. But my therapist regularly will be like. That's good. Can I use that? <laughs> like I have, a, and my very best friend is a therapist. My sister is a therapist. Like I have a lot of people in my world who are therapists and, you know, I'm, I can get in there and, um, you know, I'm pro adjacent. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That'll be our new title uh, for the day. Are you pro adjacent? I made it up right now. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> you guys. <laughs> On uh, um, okay, I, I sort of admitted I, I I fangirl you on Instagram and have for a long time. Um, I have to ask. So sometimes I get I don't even get to what you wrote because I'm obsessed with what you're wearing. Do oh, you? You're always so cute. And do you? Is fashion a fun thing for you? Like you're adorable okay. today, but on your Instagram, you're always dressed so cute. Is that a fun thing for you? Yeah, I'm very into clothes and <laughs> fashion and cute tops. I think if I hadn't been a, you know, uh, a writer and if I hadn't been a marriage and family therapist, I would have worked in fashion. Okay. And in college, I was a makeup artist. I oh, can't tell, yeah. now, but I wasn't the makeup artist who was like doing like editorial. I was a makeup artist selling stuff at the makeup counter, um, in Salt Lake city. And, um, 
that was a really fun job because it was all about connecting and everybody has something beautiful on their face. And I just really, you just learn like, you know, everybody has insecurities, but everybody has beauty and I'm very into all that stuff. Yeah. I would, I could, I could want to do a line of like date tops. Oh my God. Yeah. Always so cute. That would be so fun. See, there's not enough hours in the day for me to do all the stuff that I want to do, <laughs> but you know, it's what a, it's okay. <laughs> it's another creative outlet. It's, it's fun. Exactly. Yeah. I knit a lot. I love knitting. Like, oh my gosh, knitting I, has come knitting up a has come lot. Up. I'm just starting. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm like signed up for a class because I felt, <laughs> I've been told that it's very like type A. Like I just, I'm also tired of looking at my phone. So I'm like, I need to do something else with my hands as yes. like, you know, I'm just, I'm going into this, like, I want to turn off electronics in a lot of ways. And yes. I feel just because I feel like I, you know, like everybody, you become, yeah. you get sucked into it and I just want something else to do with my hands. So I'm like getting very into like, I'm going into a reading, like a heavier reading phase than I'm normally in, right. but like knitting is I, definitely top yeah. of my list. Yeah. Well, I love my plants. I'm, I'm very homemakery. Um, you know, I do, I'm, I mean, since I moved to Ohio and since I've been in the pandemic, like I really just love to have beautiful surroundings and spend a lot of energy making things beautiful and uh, around here, you know, mm -hmm. like my plants are doing great. I would show you some, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, I love cooking. Like I love all that stuff. Um, it's really it feels nourishing. Like it feels right. like you're building those connections and ultimately, and I mean, this is of course the research is it is no accident. I would say for me personally, that the, this show and my leaving LA were concurrent mm, yeah. um, because I have a secure base that I operate from that. I could have never done this show the way I did it. I could have done it, but like most first time creators that I personally know have ended up in the fetal position by the end. <laughs> and I feel like I am so supported by the relationship I'm in and the home that I have grown that I was able to do it with, you know, and like with a lot of grace and a lot of enjoyment yeah. mm -hmm. in the process rather than sort of that fear, that driving fear that is so much a part of well, I would say insecure attachment strategies, but also it's so much part of the entertainment business. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been really, really good for me. Like the one thing I never had in my life was this kind of home. And that for me is the Holy Grail. I was a foster child. Like I've never had a home. Not really, not like that. Not like I yeah. have now. Mm -hmm. So this is my priority in many respects and everything else flows from this but that's the research it's like when children have a secure base humans when humans have a secure base they can explore the world and accomplish way more than they're mm -hmm. able to accomplish when they don't have that so it's nothing i'm i'm not inventing this i'm not making this up it just is it's it's about understanding like how we are as a species and riding the horse in the direction it's going at least that's what i'm finding in my firsthand experience is like, it's interesting. None of this ever happened when, before I had like put this much effort into my home, mm. you know? Interesting. And, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, I don't know what the implications of that are. I'm just giving you my experience, you know? Well, Tracy, it was so nice meeting you. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, we want amazing. to have your back. Your story. Oh Thank my God. gosh. And sharing your story and your honesty. It's so inspiring. That's refreshing. Well, yes. And refreshing. Kind. Yay. Thanks, you guys. This has been a fun conversation. Absolutely. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Tracy. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe and leave a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. To stay up to date with In Her Words, join the conversation by following Women in Entertainment on our social channels and subscribe to our weekly newsletter at womenandentertainment.com.